Welcome to the Beacon Hill Podcast, helping you grow in your faith and shine for Christ. Thanks for joining us. Now here are your hosts, Pastor G.J. Farmer and the Beacon Hill Baptist Church staff. Welcome back to another week, the Beacon Hill Podcast. I'm here with Josh and Jake today. How are you guys? Doing real good. You got your Baxter's coffee. Doing you're trying to curb your appetite on this new diet you're on. I am. Was yeah. that was that public supposed to be a public thing or did I just That's encouraging. Did I just that tell might too be, much information? It might be better. Like <laughs> if I'm walking through church with a donut, really like, yeah. Hey, I thought you were on a diet. Yeah, accountability. <laughs> yeah, I got a I'm on the anti inflammatory diet. So. Okay. Well, yeah. Gotta so keep the flame if, down. If, you, <laughs> if you're on here, like after a few weeks, we could do like a like a montage. Oh yeah, to see how you get skinnier. We we could do that be before sweet. on you. If it was like Remember? a year long thing, it was just like <laughs> when you had surgery, we had that montage yeah. of Woo. where'd Jay go? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna try to lose it more gradually than 80 pounds in two months or whatever. Yeah, it was. that's pretty intense. <laughs> I've heard about that. Um, we're, di- we're diving into Acts 15 this week. Um, we were talking about how we strive to clear the way to Jesus. That's our sixth and final core value. We've been going through that series. We wrapped that up this week. And um, in Acts 15, what we see is um, the Jewish Christians. Um, they're trying to impose the Jewish law on the Gentiles who want to be Christians. And they say, you know, to follow Jesus, you have to also do the law. And we talked about how, while we don't really, um, you know, push the Jewish law on people, of course, uh, we have sometimes our own set of man-made requirements or standards that sometimes can be uh, spoken, or I would say more often they're unspoken, um, just by, you know, you kind of look around the group and, and have general assumptions like, oh, Christians must be this or do this. Uh, so a lot of times those requirements are, well, I would say often unspoken. Would you all agree with that? Or is that just an assumption of mine? I think, I think that's right. I think often it's unspoken, but, uh, anyway, in Acts 15 verse 19, um, there's this big debate that's gone on and James is talking at the end of this. And he says, Uh, Therefore, in my judgment, we shouldn't cause difficulties for those among the Gentiles who turn to God. And I do think it's worth mentioning also um, in verse 10, when Peter says, um, now then, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples necks that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? Um, He's basically saying like, we know that we haven't um, been able to keep the law. Uh, Additionally, he goes on to say, not only that, but the law doesn't save. Like we're all saved the same way by grace through faith in Jesus. And he, you know, by the end of it, uh, James is saying, so, you know, we shouldn't make it difficult for the Gentiles to follow Jesus by giving them all these additional requirements. Um, I was thinking this week how sometimes when we're kids, we are told or, you know, maybe, like I said, by an unspoken thing, we assume uh, that certain things are wrong or sinful if we do them in church or that you have to do certain things. And I was curious, j- just by way of like kind of a conversation <laughs> starter, what's something when you were a kid that you thought you had to do uh, or else maybe you were you were sinning if you didn't do this or, or whatever? Or, what are some, or if you did do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other way around. Josh, what, what about you? We'll start well, with Well, I have one. It comes right to my mind. So I, um, I went to an independent fundamental Baptist Christian school when I was in elementary. Not nothing against them. I'm sure there are great ones out there, but they did a lot when we would have chapel and different things that really um, made me believe. Uh, and being in the '80s, um, also going to a Southern Baptist uh, traditional church, then uh, and the one I could think of was. Uh, clapping in any kind of service. Mm. I mean, um, and I always thought like for any, for any, any reason, like any reason. even applause, no applause. Mm. And <laughs> this school, <laughs> when it's excited, you better keep it to yourself. <laughs> this school went as far, and I'm not kidding you. Um, if you got, if you had clapped and they called you down for it, they would send you home. 
for the day. Like, are you serious? Oh, straight up. <laughs> I mean, that's how, that's how wow. strict they were. And so what, how old were you? <clears throat> it was in the, you know, my elementary first, second, third, fourth. So did you grade. think that this was not only like against the rules at school, but this was like, just, you yeah. thought it was a sin to clap. Yeah. Because we weren't also doing it at, our, at my, you know, my home church it was traditional. Nobody would you know, throw you out. So you thought clap, like, I thought it was like, but you didn't think like it was a sin to clap at a sports game. No, or something, but it like certain environments, it was just wrong. The, to clap just in. the church environment. Kind of like you mentioned, not open your eyes during the prayer mm-hmm. that if you did that, like, mm-hmm. so if I ever heard somebody at my home, my church, like on a Sunday, do it. Like I was like freaking out. Like, yeah, they're going to kick him out uh-huh. for clapping. Yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I can't really think of a specific thing as far as like a sin. The thing that came to mind was just not understanding how church worked. And so in the first grade, I remember having a friend and I think his parents were divorced and then his mom was getting remarried and the husband was Catholic. And so he'd said one day, he's like, I'm becoming Catholic this weekend or something, you know? And he had like darker tan skin and that's what I thought he meant. (laughs) And so we were at my grandma's house and I'm like outside and you know, like I I try to be funny sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but I'm like sitting on the porch and I look at my skin and I just go, Oh man, I think I'm Catholic. (laughs) (laughs) And you were serious. Yeah, oh yeah. I was in first grade. Wow. But like my my mom and my grandma were like, "What? <laughs> what are you talking about?" And That's I was hilarious. like, "Hilarious." Uh. Yeah. So I was thinking about a couple of different things. Like one, on top of the um, close your eyes when you pray. I think another one that we probably all heard was, "Don't run in church. This is God's house. You know, you can't run in God's house." Mm-hmm. And, um, maybe it was like a thing of like just showing respect, but I think generally like, obviously it's a safety issue or whatever. And like, generally we teach our kids like don't run inside. Like that's just a general good rule of thumb. Um, but another one kind of more interesting, my granddad would not let us shoot fireworks on Sunday. Oh yeah. That was a thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I guess. I don't really know where he got that from. I don't know if that was just his thing or something his parent, because I don't know how, how, how long have Americans been shooting fireworks at home? I don't know. That's a good question though. Because like, was it a thing that his parents told him when he was a kid, were they shooting fireworks off in the forties and fifties at home? Yeah, they were. Oh, I know. I know. I, I know that because in the movie Sandlot, it's like, isn't that the fifties? And they I'm were not sure they about had that. that fireworks. Scene. Well, I I do know that there were fireworks. I'm just saying like shooting them off at home. Right. I don't know. But don't anyway, know. so my granddad, what he would do is like every year around the 4th of July, he would drive to Tennessee, load up on fireworks from those fireworks stores. And he would bring ton- way more than we could ever shoot in one weekend back. And so, Pretty much every weekend when I went to his house, we would have that case of fireworks that he had picked up. And I would like, well, yeah, any weekend I was there, we would shoot fireworks off. Like it doesn't like, (laughs) I'm sure the neighbors were like that that grandkids over again. (laughs) And we would put firecrackers in the mailbox and all this kind of stuff. But on Sundays, that's a felony. legal. (laughs) (laughs) But on Sundays, we could not shoot the fireworks. Uh, He was against that. And so I always thought, I didn't understand it, but I always thought for whatever reason yeah. it was wrong to shoot fireworks. Jesus doesn't like fireworks. Yeah. And, and then it was laborious for him. It took a lot of work. I don't know. He didn't want to work. But that would be I, the perfect day to blow up a mailbox because there's no mail in there on Sundays. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. That was one of the, the weird things. And so, uh, like I said, most of these things, you know, I was talking about on Sunday how most of these things we put in because there's like some maybe underlying principle that we're trying to honor with that thing. Like for instance, uh, we want to be respectful to God or, you know, we want to make sure that 
one day a week that we have a day set aside for the Lord or, or whatever principle we're trying to honor. Um, but then from that, we build upon it an additional teaching or, or law or rule that really is man-made. Um, this is really what happened in the time of the Pharisees. And I, I kind of was going back and forth on which teaching I was going to do this past week for this, because um, another thing that I could have taught on that I think is really important to consider when God gave the old Testament law, what happened was over time, people said, okay, well, what does God mean by um, like, um, don't covet your neighbor's house or whatever, or you could fill in the blank with, with anything in there. What does God mean by this law? Because it's not specific. And then over time, like the, the religious leaders in the Jewish, um, um, in the Jewish culture would produce their commentary on, um, the Jewish law. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe that's called the Talmud, which is basically like their commentary and their expansion on the law. By the time Jesus gets there, they are treating the Jewish, like the Pharisees and the religious leaders, like their, their word as God's word. And so basically if they had all these laws in place that said you couldn't do this and, and work on the Sabbath meant that you can't pick heads of grain or whatever, like Mm -hmm. then that was the law that everybody went by. And that's why it was so wild that Jesus was like, no, that's not what it is. And in fact, it's like Mm. the law is really about the heart more than anything. Um, that was why it was so revolutionary that and Jesus was kind of seemed like he was bucking the system because everybody else had created all these man-made laws. Um, I shared this in uh, Scottsville when I was pastoring there. We bought an oven in Scottsville. I don't know if you all have ever seen these before, but some of the ovens have a Sabbath setting on it. And basically what it does when you hit the, the Sabbath button, you would hit it on the night before Sabbath, and it would leave the oven running at a certain temperature where you could like still cook in there without hitting certain buttons uh-huh. because if you hit the buttons, it's work on the Sabbath. And so there's a Sabbath setting where you could get around that, that law right. where you could still cook, but it, in fact, it's a man-made law because work on the Sabbath, they said, well, if you push a button on the oven, it's work on the Sabbath. So we're going to make a Sabbath button so you don't break that law. That's You're allowed to put the stuff in the oven exactly, and take it out. Exactly. Like if you're <laughs> cooking, you've got to do that to survive. But you, my guess is you've probably got to like prepare your dough and all of that you the night before. This is crazy. Yeah. But yeah, so that's like huh. a modern day. It's interesting. <laughs> that's like a, yeah, a modern day <laughs> version of that. But that's exactly what was going on back then. That being said, we're not uh, Jewish. So like we don't necessarily concern ourselves, uh, overly with the law, but when it comes to, um, extra requirements and man-made, you know, laws, if you will, that we kind of impose on people, what are your all's thoughts, um, on how we identify if we are creating those or not? Like how do, how can we keep those in perspective I know for all of us, there have been times in our lives where maybe we've thought um, we've got to make sure we do or or don't do certain things for various reasons. Like, for instance, and I'll give mine, and then um, after I go, Jake, if you want to jump in there, uh, and then we'll kind of go around. But um, for me, I remember, like, when I was a kid, uh, my parents would not allow me to wear shorts to church. And so... Even as a um, college student and young adult, that was like, I guess, a parameter I put on myself. Um, Now it's a parameter I put on myself because my legs are so white. Mm. I'm like, I don't want to do that to people. Spare (laughs) spare (laughs) about other people. No, I'm just kidding about it. It's dangerous. I wear wear shorts to (laughs) mow in and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, uh, (laughs) but... So I'll say this, when I first, when we first had kids, 
I started putting that on my kids as well. Like they're not going to wear shorts to church. And I remember as they were coming to me at like, as Jack got a little older and starting to dress himself, he would get ready for church. And there were a few times like right in those early stages that he would come with shorts on and I would have him go change. And I started thinking about that more, like, why am I doing this? And when I got to the root of it, for me, if I'm honest, there were two things that contributed to that. And neither one of them were about honoring the Lord. It was about, this is how I grew up. This is how I was raised. So I'm going to continue this. And two, it was, if my kid wears shorts to church, people are going to judge us. And so because of that, I'm not going to let him wear shorts to church because I don't want people to think badly of us for doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the more I thought about that, the more I'm like, you know, these are the kind of things, because I I grew up a preacher's kid. And the more I thought about it, I'm like, these are the kind of things that honestly I resented as a preacher's kid because you know, if you feel like you're living in a glass house, you're getting judged by every, everybody. And, you know, um, I don't, I mean, I'll just share this, you know, and I don't know if my mom listens to this podcast or not, but I don't think she would be offended by me sharing this. You know, it, it made me upset. Like for instance, my, my dad would never let me go to a kid's birthday party who was in our church because he, um, he was like, well, if we go to one kid's birthday party and don't go to others uh, for various reasons, like, you know, they're going to think we're playing favorites. And uh, so therefore you can't go to anybody's birthday party from church. And I remember like as a kid, I'm like, I just want to go to my friend's birthday party, but I couldn't do that because he was worried about people judging us. Um, And so when I started putting that on my kids, like just the idea of like people judging us for different things, I was like, you know, I'm, like, I'm not going to do that to my kids. Um, you know, I, I want them to enjoy church. I don't want them to feel like they live in a bubble all the time. And, you know, if people judge us, then it's bad on them, you know, mm-hmm. instead of on me is kind of how. And so I made the decision, like, you know, I'm I'm just going to let my kids be kids and, and raise them in the ways of the Lord that the Bible teaches to do, but not put additional requirements on them because they're preacher's kids or because I was raised a certain way or whatever. So that's kind of, you know, for me, it was taking a step back when we're thinking about how we identify these and saying, what is the real reason I'm doing this? You know, and when I took a step back and really answered that for myself, it helped me realize, you know, the root of this is not really to honor the Lord. I don't know, Jake, what what about you? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think like, you know, just talking about how to recognize it. I think that can be a tough thing because of what you're talking about, where um, if you grow up hearing these things all your life, um, a lot of times on a lot of different things, we, we grow, we who grow up in church, there are a lot of different things that we've heard all our lives that aren't in the Bible, Uh, either theology or requirements like we're talking about and just different things. And so we can, it can be really easy to just assume that we're right and have a problem with whatever behavior somebody's doing. But I think that I think one of the main ways that we can do that is by examining ourselves first. Mm -hmm. So if I see Josh and Josh is wearing, I don't know, whatever. And I don't think that that's right. We need to, we need to think about like, okay, do I not think that's right because it says in the Bible that that's not right? Or is that just the way I feel and my opinion on what it is? And I should probably drop it because I don't want that to be something between me and Josh. And that will require going to scripture and figuring out if what I've been told my whole life is actually in there, you know? And I think (laughs) that a lot of, a lot of people don't do that and it can be detrimental to the church and then but a lot of people do and you f- see the church start to change and there be a much more free atmosphere and people want to be a part of it because there's not these burdens 
anymore. And so there's a reason why the Bible talks about how being in Christ sets you free. Mm -hmm. Like, and it's not just a freedom of, um, a freedom of saying, well, we're going to get to go to heaven one day and we don't have to worry about what happens when we die. It's a freedom of that comes from like, we no longer have to worry about the law or measuring up and all this. And I'm going to clarify this more in just a second, but you know, we're not talking about saying, Oh, now, you know, Jesus. And so you can live however you want to live. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're talking about. There's freedom with guardrails and boundaries that God has set but those boundaries and guardrails oftentimes are much wider than how we want to place them or, or do place them. Um, Josh, what about you? Yeah, I kind of felt the same way. You, your story resonates with me. Well, Jake, too, we're all uh, PKs, pastors, sons. But for me, I remember thinking, trying to really um, distinguish growing up among three different options. You know, A, does the Bible say this? You know, B, is it just a tradition that we've always done in the church? And as the church, you know, grows, you know, maybe it'll be more uh, you know, opening to, to people. Or C, um, is it just because I'm a, a preacher's kid? Just mm -hmm. like you, when you, you were saying your parents grow up, you know, and I was trying to figure out, you know, uh, we always have to dress really, really nice on Sunday. But, hey, Mom, my friend... Johnny over there, he, he has jeans on. You know, why can't I wear jeans? You know, and or, or whatever it would be. And just to, to try to distinguish, like you said, Jake, to go when you're old enough to really go to the word and, and see, um, you, you know, exactly what the difference is between what Jesus says in the New Testament, the law, and mm -hmm. what's acceptable. And, and that was a, it was a challenge. I remember, um, and I, and I've, I'd same as you, GJ. I find myself when I was first, um, you know, when our kids were really young and in church and being a staff, like, well, I don't want my, my kids to, you know, to look like the world, even though they wouldn't, you know, but or anything like that. And I want them to look nice and people probably have expectations and they put that on us too. They might have expectations that aren't biblical that they put on even pastors um, for what they wear or or anything like that, and it was a, you know, got down to be like, why why do I believe this? And when, when we get there and say, well, there's nothing in the Bible that says you have to wear khaki pants or, or, or mm -hmm. whatever, a collared shirt. And to be honest with you, growing up, like I talked about before, in that um, particular Christian school, you know, they, they had no problem telling you that... <laughs> Their beliefs were right. Mm -hmm. So that kind of, when you're a kid, you're like kind of skewed your mind too as well. So yeah. One of the things I would say also to this is this doesn't mean that you have to just disregard any, like everything unless it's in the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, I'll clarify, you know, cause I like, for instance, um, I know that nowhere in the Bible does it say, that when you pray, if you're wearing a hat, you should take your hat off. But that is something that I do, and that's something that I teach my boys to do uh, if they're wearing a hat. Um, but I think if you're going to do something like that, it's good to know why you do it, and if you're going to teach your kids that, it's good to say why you're doing that. And so I've talked to Jack before, like, Hey, just in our culture, this is something we do out of respect. Uh, interestingly enough, when I went to Israel and, you know, we were in the holy places over there, whatever, like you have to wear a head covering there. So I had to wear a hat mm -hmm. uh, in those places because it's like the opposite over there. They, they believe a hat uh, reminds you of someone above you, and so you wear that. Um, but here, part of our culture is we take it off. So I, th I think that there are things like that that you can still hold on to if you want. And, um, at, but at the same time, understanding that if I'm praying in a group, for example, and the guy across the group doesn't take his hat off that I, I don't need to cast judgment on him or, you know, to think of him as being a, a terrible Christian or something just because he didn't do that. Um, 
we've got to also see through some of this is cultural. Some of this is, um, you know, how we've been raised and, and what we find to be important in America or in, in Somerset, Kentucky. Um, so maybe some of that can help you gauge what you do want to hold on to and what you don't. Um, but at the same time, um, and I, I plan to do this question last, but I'm going to jump into it next. Extending grace and, and, um, um, non-judgment I guess onto people is an important practice and I was gonna I think it, it'd be good to talk about um you know have you all ever experienced a time where maybe um you were a little bit different than everybody else or or whatever and um people gave grace to you where you know maybe you didn't quite fit in or whatever and, and it impacted your faith journey I don't know Jake you don't really fit in very well I mean, you're no, kind of a weirdo. I get used to it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Ever since I turned Catholic when I was in first grade, I, you know, just get used to it. Now, I, I think, uh, you know, it's funny, like, uh, I don't, like, being a pastor, being called as a pastor is a tremendous blessing and privilege and that sort of thing. But it does come along with certain uh, like you're just under more scrutiny. There's a lot more opinions about what you do and what you don't do, that sort of thing. And, and I would say that's true for any leadership position. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And so I think, um, so this isn't me saying like, oh man, feel sorry for us because we're, you know, it's so hard. But, uh, like when I was first going, coming up into ministry and didn't have a whole lot of experience dealing with that type of stuff, there was a lot of Music is very polarizing. You know, it's like everybody's got their own opinions on what's good, what's not, and, you know, what should be played and not. And so I had a lot of people really enjoying what I was doing, but I also had a lot of people who didn't think I was doing the right stuff and I was changing stuff that, you know, shouldn't be changed and all this. And so it would have been really easy for me to get discouraged if I didn't have anybody coming up to me, I had several mostly older people that came up to me and just said, either said, Hey, I love what you're doing, whether they did or not, or they would, I would appreciated more of the people that would come up and say, Hey, you know what? It's not really my style, but I see how uh, joyful you are. I see how you're leading the church well. And I just want you to know you're doing a great job and I'm going to support you no matter what. And that meant a lot to me because when you have the opposite happening, it can be really discouraging. Mm -hmm. And I think that that helped me gain confidence and helped me to grow in my ministry um, because I had people encouraging me who I knew weren't exactly like me. It wasn't like my friends saying, Hey man, great job. You know, it was people that I knew probably didn't really care for a lot of the stuff I was doing, but they knew that why I was doing it and they mm -hmm. knew who I was doing it for and they respected that and they, <laughs> they, uh, enjoyed that. And so, and I think, you know, probably in a roundabout way, you know, when you're going through different things like that, you have people who give grace to you and saying those things or whatever, like, Hey, it's not my cup of tea, but, I appreciate how you're leading our church. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, you give grace to those who maybe don't come around to that viewpoint. Like you sure. have to extend yeah, yeah. grace to them. And so both, both ways, you know, grace is, is important because if at any point somebody stops offering grace, uh, then you're just going to have kind yeah. of an argument on your hands or whatever. And, and that's really uh, part of the reason why we have to extend that grace to each other. I think for me, I look back on times um, early in my ministry, and I mentioned to you guys, like, um, you know, I, a lot of my history here in Somerset, as far as ministry goes, is at First Baptist um, here in Somerset. And um, I think my first sermon that I preached there, I was 19. And um, I've got a video of that sermon that I have on, um, it's like the... Um, it's like on the private setting on YouTube or whatever, where nobody can watch it except me because it's we so had to bad. Get in there and see that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, but even after that, I would have people come and encourage me, and 
I feel like in some ways, like watching that sermon back when they were like complimenting and, and encouraging and things like that, I'm looking back, I'm like, y'all were lying to me, (laughs) (laughs) you know, but at this, maybe, maybe they were thinking for a 19 year old, that was pretty good, you know, and like given the stage I was in for never preaching a sermon before. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Way to, way to get up there and try, you know? And, but even that encouragement, you know, if, if, um, if I wouldn't have received that or even received like just critique only at that time in in my life, maybe I would have got discouraged and got to the point that I was like, well, maybe I'll do something different or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm, if, if I'm not cut out for this. Um, and so I do think grace was extended to me in those ways. Um, yeah. What about you, Josh? Uh, well, I was, you know, I was just thinking back to my early days in student ministry, how many mistakes that I have made that people extended grace on, particularly thinking of an event I think I had one time where we had some, you know, you want to bring kids that aren't necessarily church kids, um, but kids that maybe don't know the culture of the church, um, you know, may act differently, whatever, and mm-hmm. I can remember one time we were, I think we were playing a game and um, one of these kids uh, ran to the wall and put a ginormous hole in it. Did um, that happen to me when I was in youth group too? See, Somebody it's, else it's, did that. It must be a, a common thing. It's a common thing. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> when you have people who maybe treat God's house, the facility, you know, like it's, <laughs> like it's the, uh, you, you know, the Vatican or whatever, um, a temple, but... Uh, that can really stress you out like yeah. up to the point where you're like, man, I hope I don't get fired. Mm-hmm. Um, but having people that extend the grace be like, Oh yeah, we understand you're, you're bringing kids in here. These things happen. We'll did you ever read you. Um, Doug Fields? My first two year, years in youth ministry. Yes, I did. Do you remember his story about thinking it was a good idea to have baptism, a jacuzzi party baptism. in the baptistry? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever read that or hear about that? No. So story. Doug Fields, who was, the youth guy at Saddleback back in the day, like when Saddleback was blowing up, uh, he wrote this book and, and said like in his first two years of youth ministry, he thought it would be a great idea to allow the youth to have a jacuzzi party in the baptistry. Mm-hmm. And right. he did that for a youth event and he almost flooded got killed. It. I don't, flooded it. Didn't he, he did. I don't remember time. that detail, but <laughs> he didn't get fired. Did he? I can't remember. No. But, I mean, I think he got in big trouble for it, as you can imagine. Yeah. Now, uh, that's just not a good idea on multiple levels, but I'm <laughs> sure he experienced some grace in that, too. Uh, if you think about your life, there are probably things that you've been through where you've experienced uh, grace from maybe having the, the wrong idea about something or going about it the wrong way. or Like, we've all experienced that grace. And I think when we consider people who um, – maybe new to the faith or just questioning Christianity. Like we've got to extend that grace and even go, in my opinion, not just extend grace, go above and beyond to help them because those people, uh, they need to know Jesus and we need to go out of our way to help them to know Jesus. When they experience the grace and love from us, uh, it will show them the grace and love that Jesus offers. Um, Again, I'll keep reiterating, we're not talking about living as if there's no uh, moral uh, law or scriptures with, within the Bible that we have to follow. Um, that, that Yes, that is true, and we do want to teach each other that and hold each other accountable to that and all of those kind of things. But for people who are either unbelievers or very new to the faith especially, they have to like learn and grow in these things before, right. you know, before we can really hold them accountable to them. Um, and so we do need to give people some time and some grace uh, in those things. Um, another thing that we mentioned Sunday, it's so important to remember that God is the judge. We're not the judge. Um, I do want to make clear what I'm saying here because I think uh, our culture has hijacked that saying to, to mean that we can't ever point out sin or like we can't ever like everybody should be able to live however they want to live and that shouldn't matter. Um, and that's not true, but the Bible is clear that God is the one who sets the standard for, um, what it takes to go to heaven. Um, 
the standard for what is sin, what isn't sin, and we don't. And so when I say that God is the judge, not us, I'm saying two things. Like one, it's not our standard that people have to live up to uh, and and measure up to. Um, God's the one who sets all that. Mm -hmm. But also, we can't see people's hearts, and God's the one who sees their hearts, and he constantly reminds us of that. Um, You know, that's really what that judge not, lest you be judged, passage is all about is um you know extending the grace to people that that we've been extended and want to uh, want to be extended to us and remembering that god's the one who sees the heart but how does remembering that god's the judge not us um maybe change the way that we view and interact with people who are you know seeking jesus out like they're they're looking for the things of the lord like just you know first questioning or maybe just new to the faith, how does remembering that maybe help us keep the right perspective on how we should treat other people? Josh, what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, just, you know, I was just thinking, um, particularly like whenever you're witnessing somebody or interacting with somebody, like you said, that's new to the faith or, or not even a Christian yet, you know, that, that kind of thing is part of our testimony acting that way. I mean, they, they could be looking for those sort of things like, you know, I've heard all I heard about as Christians is that they judge people mm-hmm. you know, and they know understanding. Um, and, and rightly there is a, uh, sometimes a fine line between Christian uh, admonishment, I would say, where you, you know, speak into somebody's life in sin or whatever and judging them. And I mean, for Christians it's important to understand that, you know, God's eyes, we're all, you know, we've all sinned and fall short of his glory. You know, whether it's uh, this person who's struggling with, you know, alcoholism or, or drugs or whatever, or kind of like I would say like a preacher's kid who maybe one day was not a Christian and then the next day was. You know, in God's eyes, we're all uh, all the same. And for me, you know, that's that's an it's important to try to I say view everybody through the same lens, you know, um, I guess where you can just see people as uh, how Jesus saw them, just lost souls. Mm -hmm. Jake. Yeah. I think, uh, one of the things that I've had to really learn over, you know, the course of my spiritual walk is just, I I struggled for a while placing standards on people who aren't believers as mm-hmm. if they were believers and yeah. expecting expecting non-believers to behave like they know Jesus and so um i i just remember it was easy for me to kind of say like man why don't they why don't they just do this why can't they figure this out and it really it affected the way that i was interacting with them because it was like I was treating them almost like they should be here and they're not. And then it was almost like, uh, it wasn't me trying to help them to get where they needed to go. It was me like almost like trying to stay out in front just to stay up on a, some kind of pedestal or something, you know? And I didn't consciously think that that's what I was doing, but it was, you know, because I was placing, what I thought were the standards on that person, it was making it tougher for me to, to actually be a witness to them. And a couple of people were like family members of mine. And so I think realizing that people who are believers, we can, you know, the Bible talks about us needing to judge behavior by his standard. And so being able to discern what's right and what's wrong and be able to call that out in each other in order to, to sharpen one another in our faith. But people who are non-Christians that we're trying to, to reach, you know, our, our goal should be to reach them with the gospel and allow God to change these other things about them that maybe they're doing wrong. And I think we, we focus more on the behavior sometimes than we do their hearts and that can be detrimental. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. I think as you know, as we're thinking about all these things, we've got to remember that it's the gospel that 
that changes people and not a list of do's and don'ts. That's in fact, that's one of my, I guess, kind of a pet peeve of mine, um, is how insistent people have been in recent years on putting the 10 commandments everywhere. Um, I get why they want to do it because it shows like God's law, but outside of a context around it, like the 10 commandments can't save anybody. We all fall short of, of that. And while, yeah, that's like stuff that God has said to do out of context with the gospel, it could be very easy for that to be off putting to people. Or I would say also like for people to say, well, if I do these 10 things and just try hard enough, then I get to go to heaven because this is what God has said. And that, I guess that's one of my, my big things is like, you know, we got to give people the gospel and not give them law. Like the law is there to show us the need for the gospel. That's why it's there. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we talk about sin. We talk about how we've broken the law, but it doesn't take long to get to the point to say, okay, yeah, we've broken the law. Like we, we're, we're sinful and, um, we're headed for hell based on God's standards. Now we need the gospel and without the gospel, you know, being preached to people, they're just going to have all kinds of, of standards and expectations placed on them. Um, that the Bible says clearly, even here in Acts 15, like we know that stuff doesn't save. Uh, it's only Jesus who saves. And so we need to just as much, or I would say not just as much, even more so as sometimes we like place expectations on people or like say we're going to remove those, but then we're going to say we're going to preach the gospel and proclaim the gospel to people. And so they can actually be saved and, and hear it because that is the thing that changes lives. Um, we're wrapping up this series, uh, but all of these core values and our mission statement, everything will persist in everything we do. We're going to remind the church uh, of them from time to time. Let me encourage you. Uh, maybe you're listening to this and you've been to church and a lot of the stuff that we're talking about is the reason perhaps you don't go to church anymore or maybe don't go very frequently when you go um let me encourage you to not give up on these things just because you've had bad experiences like all three of us will sit here and say there have been things that we have experienced in church that are not so good but at the end of the day we know that church is a very good thing it is um the thing that um that the lord wants us to to be involved in and he uses to grow us to become more like Christ. Uh, in fact, the church are the people of God gathered together. And ultimately the Bible says that Christ died for the church. And, um, so it's a very good thing. Um, and if you don't have a church home, we'd love to have you connect with us sometime at Beacon Hill. We meet every Sunday at nine fifteen for groups and ten thirty for worship this Sunday. If you've been thinking about coming would be a great time to come. We're starting a new series. will last for two weeks through the book of Philemon. And um, there's some really cool stuff in there about um, helping us um, see ourselves in Christ and not as the world sees us or maybe as we ourselves see us, but viewing us um, through the lens that Christ views us and some things about forgiveness and other things. Um, that'll be cool. So plan to join us for that. Any final thoughts you guys have? I like to ask That's because great. on occasion we'll get a little witty thing from Joel, but he's not here today. Joke. So, yeah, no jokes from you guys. So Insert Joel comment here. Yeah. Anyway, I hope you have a great rest of your week uh, and hope to see you soon uh, here at Beacon Hill. You've been listening to the Beacon Hill Podcast. For more information about Beacon Hill Baptist Church, visit beaconhillbaptist.com.